as well. That way we can see each other. So this is a this is a conversation stemming from a community of practice that uh, John uh, Galdino and myself have been trying to nourish over the last few months, which we're calling um, the future of global security. So this is very much John's doing, um, and um, but it's been, become a collaborative effort now. And in one of our recent conversations with the, with the security forum, we realized that reality was uh, sort of um, on the line or was, was, was worth being discussed. So we said, let's turn that into a panel uh, or a conversation during the summit. And, um, and if you're just joining the summit, um, thanks for being here. We're, we're envisioning, we're doing several of these um, sessions and trying to keep a lively conversation on multiple topics pertaining to futures literacy. And this one should be wild. Let's see where it ends up. Again, everyone's being invited in as a panelist. Do switch on your cameras, do switch on your mics. We want to, we have nothing to say. I mean, we have a few guiding slides, uh, which I can pull up, but I think the, the underlying idea is, it's really a conversation amongst all of us. And yeah, um, I, I think there's a little bit of like Ayahuasca on the ready just in case, but like overall, it's just totally conversational and emerging. So we'll, we'll see how things go. Yeah. yeah, there should be a package of DMT in your <laughs> in your in your inbox. Um, you, you never know how the jokes are going on Zoom when the cameras are off <laughs> and the everyone's muted. You just you never know how things are landing. A few people, but otherwise, yeah. Yeah, worst case scenario for stand up. Like there's, no, there's no feedback. <laughs> it's just everything falling flat. But you can also imagine that people are laughing on their own. On mute. Totally, totally. Mm -hmm. I actually, even in even when I do jokes live, I imagine they're laughing on the inside. So for me, it's really no different. <laughs> yeah, so. Wow, still people joining. Cool. Yeah. And this session, we can let it run longer. So that's that's uh, that's a possibility because we don't have anything else. Yeah, no, the only, yeah, so we do, we can, yeah, this can, this can go into overtime, no worries. And we do have a bit of a script. I'll pull up some slides. Wow, a bunch of people showing up, this is cool. So everyone, everyone joining us now, you're being invited in as panelists, which means you're free to turn on your camera. Um, and if something isn't working, post it in the chat. Hi, Oliver, hi, Mark. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Yeah, different different from, from our other uh, conversations that we usually uh, host uh, under Chatham House rule. So uh, nothing stays. Uh, not, like you, you, you should not um, attribute anything you hear to any person in the room. Uh, this, this one is the opposite. So like it's going live on YouTube right now. So uh, just just so you know, like, and it's being recorded. So it's the completely opposite. So like people not only will see this uh, live now, they will see whatever we are talking about on YouTube later on. So like, if you have any problem with that, like uh, let us know, or just uh, be aware of that. Uh, yeah, just to reemphasize that. So you, this this conversation today stems from this community of practice that John Galdino and myself have been uh, trying to develop uh, for the last few months. Some of the participants are from that community, and usually these conversations are under Chatham House rules. They're 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 not recorded. They're not, uh, and there's no attribution. But today is the opposite of that. Um, we're all live, um, so which which hopefully will work. And the, um, I think, and we would just want to, yeah, we want to prime, actually, let me set up the screen share. So now we have several people. Galdini, if you can keep an eye on the attendees list and just keep putting people in as, um, as panelists, I'll quickly run through what we have in mind. Um, but I'm going to emphasize that this is, this is meant to be a very open-ended, lively conversation. And as John said, everyone should have received a package of ayahuasca in the mail. If you haven't, 
uh, it's just stick to coffee because we do want to deconstruct uh, the, the, the perception of consensus reality to some extent. And a um, bit of housekeeping, if you want to add your organization to the conversation, you can edit your name on Zoom. Uh, we've added the, uh, the brackets with EV when we're envisioning people. And um, if you want to represent your organization, you're welcome to do so. If not, that's fine. There we go. And we're gonna try keeping this a little bit structured with a round of introductions and then some round table, uh, round table topics. Um, so first and foremost, I'm Michelle, I'm primarily an information designer and a technology futurist, and also a little bit in charge of envisioning. And with me are Galdino and John, who will introduce themselves. Galdino, uh, I come from design, but I work with uh, this, uh, connection between design and ethnography, and also with future studies. And I'm a research fellow at Envision. Hi everyone, I'm John. I'm a senior research fellow and visiting professor at Westminster International University in Tashkent, Uzbekistan, but I'm currently based in Minsk, Belarus. Uh, my background and training is out of the University of Hawaii Futures Program. So my sense of reality is weird to begin with anyway. So really looking forward to engaging with all of you and talking about what that might mean and look like in the future. And uh, we wanna hear from you guys. So those on the panel, which should be everyone, um, do tell us where you're from. And um, if you wanna represent an organization, that's fine. If not, just tell us how you perceive reality, I guess. So, Oliver, Alan, you might wanna go first. Don't forget to unmute yourselves. Um, I'm Alan, I'm from Cape Town, South Africa, and really quite new to the whole futurist um, conversation, really. My background is in architecture and design. And um, yeah, I've just been very interested to listen to all of the conversations and actually get a little bit into into what this actually is, you know, um, and potentially applying it to where I work. I work for an NGO um, and yeah, it's, it's just been very interesting up to now. Oliver. Um, yes, good morning. Um, so I'm Oliver. Um, uh, I'm not a futurist at all. I come from I'm sorry to say that the real world and I run companies from a multinational company to startup company. And um, for a couple of months now, I'm very much interested in uh, future thinking and future literacy because we have a, I'm convinced that I have, uh, we have a, um, um, something to do uh, to, to, to literate people. I was with a bunch of uh, 25 years old people yesterday um, I realize how much these people need future literacy to really be able to handle uh, the major uh, issue, the major question uh, just in front of us. So that's really the, my objective is to, to, to become more literate about future, to be able to, 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 transfer, to transfer this, as well as my uh, background as a general manager of uh, various companies and various businesses. Thank you. Uh, does anyone else in the panel, hi Stefan, um, does anyone else want to introduce themselves to the group? Tell us yeah, where you're I from. Can, I can do yes. that. Um, I'm Stefan, I'm a designer and I have also a strong interest in speculative design. So that's why I'm also interested in future literacy. I live in, I'm living in the Netherlands and uh, right now the way I stay in touch with uh, the reality is with media, uh, but also with a critical perspective, not always believing everything, but yeah. Thank you. Anyone else wants to either turn on their camera or not, or just introduce themselves. Otherwise we can jump into the uh, topic of the day. Hi, Caroline. I'm Caroline. Um, I am a research fellow at Envisioning and also experimentalist and artist, and very curious to see where this discussion will bring us. So I'm going to prime 
the conversation with the quote that I think kickstarted this session in the first place. And this has been attributed to Karl Rove and a few other people, but I think it really wraps up or summarizes the, 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 so the phase we're going through right now. So people like you are still living in what we call the reality-based community. You believe that solutions emerge from your judicious study of discernible reality. That's not the way the world really works anymore. We're in an empire now, and when we act, we create our own reality. And while you're studying that reality judiciously as you will, we'll act again, creating other new realities, which you can study too. That's how things will sort out. We're history's actors, and you, all of you, will be left to do, will, will be left to just study what we do. So this attributed to Karl Rove, for, for those who don't know him, he was a, I mean, he, he influenced Republican um, politics for over a decade, uh, if not more. And in so many ways, the sort of post-truth, fake news, Trumpism, like all of that, in my opinion, can be seen as a direct descendant of this quote. Whether it happened or not, uh, it still describes what we're going through, which is to say, look, if you don't agree with what's happening, create your own reality and just push it out, use the internet, use the news, use whatever to create fractured or splintered realities that other people can then tap into and believe. And this seems to be what's happening. So I think we want to prime this as what happens when there is no consensus reality. Um, yeah, go. Yeah, and just to jump in quickly on that point. So I think what was interesting and to speak to Michelle's point and also a point that um, Olivia had mentioned, like, you know, as early as the 1980s, when the, the kind of neoliberal capitalists got in bed with the Christian conservatives in the US, they built this machine. And I think as we're seeing now with like the rise of Trumpism, but also the kinds of nationalism that we're seeing globally, um, they never built an off switch. So the machine has just run haywire. And now we're at a point where, you know, like in the US, you've got, you know, 18 states who are basically trying to get this court case to the national level the, to kind of overturn the election. And so, uh, you know, and in this previous group that we had this last conversation, I, I think I opened my big mouth and said, yeah, it feels like the future of reality is at stake. But again, it's not just localized to the US, you find it's in different contexts. And so whether we're talking about the, the, weapon, the weaponization of social media or the opportunity for state level or non-state actors to be able to engage, you know, misinformation, disinformation, uh, WhatsApp groups running rampant throughout a variety of different contexts. Um, I think it is fascinating. And I also wanted to come back to what Olivia had mentioned around this point about younger generations and futures thinking. I actually think it's in some ways um, inverted. I think it's actually older generations that we're finding are being quite susceptible to a lot, of, a lot of these attacks. And, and so how do we actually find ways of helping to facilitate a greater sense of literacy, both media and both futures uh, amongst a variety of generations? And, and so what, what would that look like to bring this to you know, older generations or to develop models of consensus reality? Because I know there, at least when I look at my Facebook feed, which I try to not look at very much, um, the kinds of you know, information from a random high school contact versus a you know, some like one of my mom's friends that I happened to meet at a party however many years ago um, and the kinds of stuff that comes through. So I think it is a multi-generational question. And I think there is a lot at stake in, in where we seem to be headed or where we don't want to be headed. You're all invited to speak. Don't forget to unmute yourselves. I want to add that um, we have this, everything that we call like society or even like laws that we seem like a, a law, for example, feels so real, but it's something that someone, even even money, like it's, it, a law is just something that someone wrote down on a paper and like many people believe it and then it became reality. Uh, so it, the feeling is that like this is shifting and maybe like it's a consequence of what we have been calling uh like the, the your digital bubble so like because you tend to interact online or offline like you stay like in this bubble like you just if you're a conservative you won't talk to conservatives and you end up uh, getting more and more uh closed and it seems like in the past uh, maybe that was uh, not so dangerous or, or didn't uh, grow that fast. But now with uh, the possibilities we have to connect uh, so many people so fast, uh, it seems like it's really, uh, it can like create like alternative or, or parallel uh, visions of reality where people see even the same facts, 
uh, but they can have like a very or completely different interpretations. Uh, like you, you have someone giving a speech and right after you, you have people online discussing and having like completely different interpretations of what this person is, is, is saying. And worse than that, sometimes what you have is um, um, uh, dog, dog whistles. So like uh, even uh, like some people will get what is behind uh, the discourse and some people don't. So like even discussing if that was an algorithm or not is, is, is hard. And then like uh, it, it, of course, like lately was more into to the extreme right and like fascist movements doing that kind of on the, in the open, uh, but without like being, being caught. So like uh, that's again, like that was one of the, a, a little bit of the background to to bring this this discussion to to the table, but uh, I, I would like to hear if anyone else like has seen or or, or felt like this like um, different realities happening around you. I didn't feel it that much, but from from what I see is that like the 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 opinions that people have, they they are kind of reinforcing themselves, and they try to opinion becomes like not reality, but um, uh, the base for the truth, and also to to for rational or irrational thoughts, and I think so, so social media and uh, have expanded actually this this effect like the, the, some people take value their opinions as a truth or the basis for filter to understand reality yeah i agree like it's uh, nowadays it's, it's very easy to to get in like a a rabbit hole like if you have any crazy idea it's quite easy to to find your crazy peers online somewhere and just like reinforce uh that vision uh anyone has seen like something especially weird or or like how how is this a thing or or something like that what arthurs now is your time to shine oh pasta for reason actually I don't know if you're familiar with that one. <laughs> I mean, I haven't met any, uh, I, I didn't meet anybody actually believing it, but like the, just the fact that the movement actually exists, there's a lot and I find it funny. Yeah, so so just a background on that. Um, there was this, uh, this great movement that evolved, um, like trying to, invert or or realign some of the ideas of let's say the like abrahamic religious traditions and the idea was that a great like a giant spaghetti monster created the universe and so you have instead of rastafarians pastafarians and so they've tried to establish actual like a religious context and i think what's amazing about that in relation to some of the comments right um and also galbino's kind of you know point and and michelle's opening framing I mean, we lose sight of the fact that, you know, everything around us in society is a social invention. Um, and so, you know, with that comes a lot of power. So, you know, ideally that, that that's the power and agency and the hope that we can reinvent those things. But I think now the challenge is like, there seems to be so much fragmentation that, and this was again about consensus reality. Um, is it even plausible that there is consensus reality such that we could think about realigning um, you know, some of those social, uh, let's say, fabrics that we have. Like, you know, for example, one of the things, and not to make this just about the U.S., but in the U.S. is the opportunity to have a constitutional convention where you could actually, you know, oh, crack open the Constitution and, you know, have that conversation. The challenge is that, you know, the number of states needed to do that, um, and, and basically Republicans are controlling a number of state legislatures. So in other words, it could be worse. Right. So in other words, the kind of conversation you think you would want to have as a society um, could even become worse. And, and we seem to be seeing that more and more. Right. Like this kind of pendulum that's certainly swinging politically in the U.S. But um, also, and Andre's got a great point in the chat around different timelines. 
So like, you know, like I think pr we probably all felt that this year, right? Like time has felt simultaneously fast and simultaneously slow. And so the kind of tempo of realities has also um, been quite mutative as well. And I think if we bring this back to like, you know, from a social fabric consensus reality, even like a security perspective, how do you begin to like, you can't manage that. You can navigate it, you can try to nudge it, but like, it really seems like something that is, it is once you start to peel back the layers or crack it open, like, I, I don't know if it is, if it is something, it's a complex system. So like how you begin to engage with that, I think is an interesting question. To what extent do you think we live in a shared reality? I mean, how much of our reality is individual versus collective? If there's, if that makes sense. Yeah, my, my two cents on this is there was a really great work by a guy, Tim Morton, who talked about kind of hyper objects. Um, and in his book, he talked about things like climate change, which, you know, like regardless of the kinds of, you know, like, fragmentation of realities i think that like there there are things at such a scale like climate change that like crash through those you know those those kind of glass barriers and boundaries right so you know even if the folks in orange county you know like want to put up walls and live in those communities and deny it like at a certain point that reality is going to come crashing down now clearly it's going to be felt differently let's say in you know i don't know daca versus you know like you know orange county but like that at, at a certain point, like that shared, re the, the kind of realities of the of the system, right? The earth being, you know, relatively speaking, a closed system are gonna like, you know, the constraints will be felt. But I guess it is a question of like scale and tempo and, and what that kind of, yeah, what that looks like. I, I actually have a question uh, that, uh, that came to my mind. Uh, before going to the this uh, round table like i'm wondering like how will societies will actually face the fact that multi realities of citizens um live together like that's something that we didn't see in the history i think so i'm really curious about how different realities will actually um cohabit in societies because it doesn't seem like something possible. What's your thought about that? <laughs> Nobody. Hard question. Well, it's, yeah, yeah, it's an amazing question. I mean, I, I guess I guess just quickly two cents is like, you know, whether we whether we would want it or not or realize it or not, society, quote, in brackets, had people whose job was to quote manage certain kinds of things, right? So like if you were in a medieval village, like, you know, like the, the certain members or leaders or people affiliated with the church, if you were in Europe, they kind of quote managed society in a certain space. So do we end up in a space in the future where we agree upon or we delegate people to be managers of social reality or constructors of consensus reality? Um, you know, Facebook has this army of people who are trying to kind of relegate info, but, and Marcella put this in there, Brexit's a great example. It was the bending of reality, right? The bus going around and talking about the millions of euros or pounds is going here, but like, you know, just the, the outright falsehoods that were being spread. Um, so like, do we need like this consensus urban versus rural reality managers? Is that gonna be a job in the future? And like, what kind of training do you need for that kind of job? And thinking about like what that looked like in the past. And then, and how do we keep it from being super normative, right? I mean, we don't want this kind of like, you know, Brazil scenario, 1984 Orwellian, right? But like, how do you find that sweet spot of having some kind of shared consensus reality to deal with things like climate change, but also having the, you know, diversity and plurality and inclusivity of, you know, radical dynamic culture. So, so from, from what I understand, it could be like a, a central authority managing different realities and uh yeah making a balance out of them right yeah or maybe like different reality collectives right mm -hmm. so like you have a membership in a certain reality collective or you have uh passports for different reality collectives and you you know 
you get to go back and forth and then you want to branch off and start your new reality cooperative um you know like i don't know like some kind of tiered system right like you can imagine like different ways and that kind of exists already right like what is you know people are doing on discord versus tiktok versus instagram right like and and the kinds of already crisscrossing that we have going on there and to some degree that was also the, i mean the role of religion is to some extent the the, the splintering of several realities right uh, the old step, I mean, some of them stem from the same principles, but they end up being um, patronizing, literally, um, and hierarchical and deterministic. And, and you end up sort of being squeezed into different ways of perceiving the world that are uh, shaped by, by that particular religion. I think what's new now is that we access other people's realities more than ever, but these realities always existed, the, the different uh, way of um, perceiving things and really uh, entire realities actually, but what is overwhelming is that we now see all these other realities and I think it's physically um, impossible to really digest everything, so we, everyone is really confused. Yeah, mm, yes, but uh, I share this point of view. I mean, um, it becomes too complex. Um, I think in the future, people will try to simplify things and they will simplify it belonging to communities, communities of people sharing the same value, the same vision, the same way of living. And they will create their own world, their own city, their own way of living. But isn't it will this spark some kind of friction actually for instance if you take uh, the united states if you have um yeah gated community gated communities of different people with a different vision of a uh, specific reality um how will that work with uh, for instance uh, another community which is based just next to this one uh, will there will be will there will be war like uh, i don't know like how Co yeah, cohabitation uh, will work. Um, my understanding of things, and that seems to me, and I get to, to nobody else, is that um, we will go through very difficult time in the coming years, coming decades. And after these very, very conflicting, conflicting times, people will need a break, we need a rest. And they will join communities well, it will be much more peaceful and maybe each community will connect to each other in network and they will exchange, but they will stay in their own, their own community where things are much more simple, less complexity, less chaos, less... But maybe it will be just a temporary phase and after that, after that once they, they regain confidence, they will merge again into something different, but uh, there will be kind of this uh, post-normal thing. Maybe this is going a little bit back to, to the comment on, on, on religion, but if you think about it, like uh, uh, how Catholicism came from, from, or Christianism came from Judaism in a sense, and then they like, became like a different vision of reality. And, and they shared to a point that our calendars <laughs> are globally aligned, doesn't matter how much uh, or, or which religion you follow, you're probably following the, the Christian uh, calendar. So some, some cultures keep their calendar going just, just to, to make sure everything is, is, is still there, but like mostly we do this. Um, so maybe like there's a, like a different uh, parallel uh, lines. And again, like as, as we, we already say, like it's easier than ever before to, even if you have like the weirdest uh, uh, set of ideas to find like a couple of people globally uh, pretty fast and pretty easily. Like the, the same tools we are having here to, to have this, this conversation, other people can use to spread any kind of, of, of crazy visions on, on, on how they, they think the world, the, the world works. Yeah, just to hop on that point, I mean, I, 
you know, I mean, we can go into religion more, but also like, if you think about the air traffic control system, like I'm a really big fan of consensus reality. Like I'm really glad that we have some international standards and like that, that kind of works. Right. I mean, but also like I, I, I was raised in the U S so like, I have no idea what a centimeter is. Uh, you know, like there's, there's like some kind of failing, like that we, like there's some, like some kind of like standards in relation to things like that, that allow us to have shared conversations. Um, and I think that, um, like Marcella put in some good points, like this, like polarization, fragmentation, like, you know, like the kind of tensions, right? I, I think, I think that stuff does play out. And it's interesting to see it play out at different levels, right? So like, maybe it's not this kind of like hot war conflict, but like, you know, you find different tensions and, and that stuff happens around standardization. And you look at, you know, how, uh, you know, America has put its, its boots in the ground, if you will, with regards to not going off of that, the imperial system, right? Like, I would love to know what a kilometer really is like, you know, like that level of like trying to, you know, have that sh sense of shit, like as a planet. Right. Um, and not to go off into outer space, but like we may as well, because about reality. Right. There was that recent news report um, about the Israeli space guy. Right. Who was like, oh, yeah, there's a galactic federation, um, but they think we're idiots. So they're pretty scared of us. So like until we get our act together, they can't hang out with us. Right. And OK, whether or not you believe that, but like that's. That, that narrative, that story really stuck with me because it's like, oh, that would make perfect sense, right? That like, yeah, they'd look at us and be like, man, these guys are hicks. Like we can't, we can't be dealing with those folks. But then again, if you also look at, okay, if you were the Trump administration and you found out about this, what would be your first reaction? Your first reaction would be to build a space force, right? To put the military in space, which is exactly what they did. So like, I don't know, like I, I feel like that, you know, whether or not that specific thing is real or not is less important than the kinds of reactions that it spurs and the kinds of questions and the, the ethical considerations. And to bring this back to this broader question around polarization, I, I don't, is it, is it just generational? I mean, are we just waiting for people to die and is it going to get better? I mean, certainly in the U.S., I think that's the hope politically. Um, you know, the demographics are not in the favor of the dark forces, so it's a waiting game. But, but that, this was my fear is like, are they going to take reality down with them before they go, right? And that seems to be the, the play is like willing to set the world on fire and willing to like forego reality. And certainly Carl Rove clearly thinks that um, because they know they're losing, right? And it's just a matter of time. Yeah, I was just, just kind of thinking out loud now, uh, but maybe this is a way of using, like we use like alternative futures to talk about the future is almost as doing that for the present. Like you just bring, uh, and like it or not, like there is a alternative reality, alter alternative or maybe the real reality where there is like a, 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 a galactic federation and we just don't know about it uh, and is, is on the table now. Well, now we know about it. Yeah. It's a new reality. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, apparently a real possibility. So like, if that is true, like what we can expect from that, like we'll, we will have like people starting to, to create like a, um, earth versions of, of it, like uh, to sign up. Um, like con artists to create like a, a fake website saying like oh sign up for the for your galactic passport here or or something that line shall we <laughs> yeah why not um i had a really interesting question come through right like i i guess like i i've been pretty open about like politically where i stand but also this question around like you know kind of truth claims right and like you know how do you engage with people that disagree with you um yeah. at least from my perspective like i i try to remain open and try to always keep it about the future um and and of course being a like you know practicing professional futurist like how i might speak in this engagement is different from like how i might speak with a client or whatever but like i think the idea of of what we've seen happen play out relates to something deep within future studies so there's a futurist fred pollock who wrote a book called the image of the future and he talked about these societal narratives and optimism versus pessimism or being, you know, rooted in the future versus being nostalgic. And so for me, the challenge is not necessarily about people who I disagree with, um, but necessarily people whose root and basis for reality is premised solely on a, on a past versus the idea of like Galdina is saying, can we explore alternative futures? And so that, you know, I'm, I'm more than happy to talk to people who, you know, love Trump or whatever and have that conversation and go into it. But like, 
you reach a certain point where you realize actually what's really at stake is are we are we being forward looking or like the make America great again ethos kind of implies that like no people are actually only invested in recuperating a past that let's be honest probably never really existed or never existed in the way that they imagine it um, and certainly wasn't as great for everybody, right? If you think about this kind of like 1950s Americana vision that seems to underlie a large part of this kind of, you know, make America great ish again type thinking. So I think this question around like, you know, truth claim is I wouldn't, I wouldn't claim to know, I certainly claim to know what the future is going to be um, or, or what, you know, is a uh, capital T truth best. Um, but I think it is about keeping the conversation going. And I think that to me is the difference, right? Is either we keep a conversation going and open about the future and what's possible, um, or we kind of colonize the future and the future is kind of, you know, enclosed within a certain frame of no, no, this is the future or this is the best future. And I don't know, my, my stance would be to try to keep that future more open. But I think the political realities and the polarization that we're seeing is precisely forces trying to colonize the future versus keep it an open space, a plural space that we might be able to, to shape through conscious action today. I have a question, like, uh, I think we have an assumption in, in the conversation that we, we we're talking about like uh, realities with uh, social media, like technologies of information shaping realities. And well, will the, what about like uh, technologies that actually shape realities like virtual realities or augmented realities? Like, will there be at some point also a discussion about what is real? Well, I think with AR, that'll become, I mean, we'll always, know, I think we will always know when we're, I mean, for the foreseeable future, we'll always know when our perceived reality is being affected by AR, AR or VR. Um, you know, but what happens if someone grows up in VR? Yeah, like maybe somebody will say, um, I'm, I, le I lived for 10 days in a VR environment. Now it became my reality and nobody will take it from me. So, it could also, the discourse can actually also go into this that, that direction, right? I think it all, I mean, I think this also op opens up the possibility of creating our own realities. I mean, given that reality is crafted by our choices, um, you know, we cannot do away with gravity but we can do other things to affect or shape our reality in one, one way or another. And I think, again, futures literacy, from my perspective, aligns closely with that. It's about creating alternative alternatives to, to consensus reality, um, either by making people more aware of, say, their, their anticipatory assumptions um, or the role technology plays in shaping the future, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think it also opens up the possibility of us literally making new realities um, you know in, in a weird way I can speak from my experience of, of you know building a company entrepreneurship um, you know a decade ago this was an idea and, uh, and and here we are so it's it's a very real thing where something exists in your mind and then given enough effort and attention um, it, it becomes real and I think we can we, I think we can all relate to that. Um, in, in different degrees and at different times of our lives, creating something that doesn't exist. Um, and it doesn't seem that miraculous when you're, when you're through it, but if you look back and see like the, what led up to having shaped reality, I think it, at least, it, I think it teaches us that we have a lot more agency than it seems. Yeah, I mean, not to go fully down the rabbit hole, but we may as well. I mean, <clears throat> you know, there are probably really clear political reasons as to why future studies, future thinking, futures literacy is not taught in schools. I mean, we teach history specifically to enculturate and to normalize certain narratives, right? So imagine societies where you were actually dispersing and making collective capacity futures literacy. Uh, it might be hard to have a stable political order. Uh, you know, it might be hard for certain powers to, quote, colonize the future or to establish, right, particular norms to a certain advantage. So, you know, part of, I think, one of the challenges and one of the opportunities of certainly, um, so they had mentioned this kind of post-normal time that we find ourselves in is precisely to 
think about dispersing further, right? Making more participatory, collaborative, collective means by which multiple generations can engage in, you know, having clarity, making explicit our assumptions, uh, anticipatory assumptions, um, becoming more literate in these images of the future, but also really taking action to shape um, these possible futures. And um, that in and of itself, I think is a radical political act that I think speaks to, uh, again, confronting some of these more controlling colonizing forces. I'm going to highlight the um, so some uh, the um, hyper normalization was mentioned in the chat, and um, I don't know if it was a direct reference to Adam Curtis's documentary, but I did post links to the documentary, which is on YouTube. It's a three-hour trip, um, the uh, the video, and um, it was created before Brexit and before Trump. It was right around the time I think it came out in 2016, but it was must have been produced slightly before. If you haven't watched hyper normalization, I recommend. Uh, are highly recommended uh, with or without um, drugs. Yeah, and an even earlier piece I really like is um, the Adam Curtis, The Power of Nightmares, um, which goes back a little bit further. That that in and of itself, I think, is a lot of foundational stuff for hypernormalization, but I think is also really great too. So I highly recommend that. And Andre is sharing a Instagram story poll. I'm trying to load it in my browser, but I don't think it's working. Let me see. I don't know if anyone else has been able to load it. But he's polling people on the concept of reality. Maybe he wants to talk about it. And then maybe you could uh, open your mic and, and talk a little bit about your Instagram ideas. It doesn't seem to be working in my browser or my phone. Okay. So maybe uh, talking about like, uh, I don't want to say next step, but like, what can we see for the future? Like how do you do? Does anyone see like ways uh, that we could have like more? If, if a shared sense of reality is something that we want, if we want that, how can we build that kind of uh, collective sense? Any ideas? It's Just uh, another thing. I yeah, right. I mean, it's a lot, but thinking out loud, like I actually think like part of our, you know, part of our approach needs to be, you know, the process is more important than the product, right? So like it's this continual kind of wayfinding and that might seem a little bit un not uninspiring, but maybe like, um, all right, maybe unfulfilling, but like, I think that continual process has a lot of value, right? Because it, it becomes cathartic in lots of ways. Like, I think there is a, there is the way in which we maybe subconsciously or you know internalize the kind of social media scape. So like, why aren't there more places and venues? And clearly we have these conversations with friends or maybe even family, but like, how do we find spaces where, yeah, with total strangers, you can talk about the future of consensus reality and have that be you know normalized, right? And find ways of doing that. And maybe that's what social media is for some people, but I also think what Galdino said holds that we, all, we often find ourselves maybe unknowingly in these filter bubbles. So. Maybe it is about trying to forge those spaces where 
you know, we have we have Extinction Rebellion and climate assemblies. Why don't we have reality assemblies, right? Like spaces where, you know, we could gather to think about what it looks like to help maintain or keep or navigate or create something like that. Yeah, I like I like to think science uh, in general. So like the idea of science and let's say the what we understand as science nowadays uh, could be guiding that, but also in some sense uh, the 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 funny and ironic thing that is sometimes science is run like a little bit like like a belief system where you have to do all the rituals that are expected. Uh, from the people in that uh, scientific community, if you if you uh, are not in the same um, set of ideas, like you you are considered too weird and kind of ostracized, uh, and and you have like ideas that are just prohibited or even to explore, uh, and then that's what what I say. Like when I find something that is like just a theory or something that is really weird and say like, yeah, that's, that's my fat earth. I want to, I want to just play with this idea here. Could be like the, the, the galactic, galactic federation sounds like a good uh, playing field right now. Um, but yeah, so like, uh, is this um, possibility of like maybe science, but what, what could be another system similar to science or as reliable as science to that like people can check and maybe science is not not doing the job right right now yeah that's a super interesting point so there is i mean there is kind of this break within science and there has been recently a group i say recently in the past like few decades of like post-normal science and this relates to the group who's been working on kind of theory of post-normal times and there's this idea of an extended peer community you know so how do you do science at a time when facts are uncertain or values are kind of at stake and the idea is you you have to distribute some of the decision making. Um, and I think that has blended also into kind of like approaching the idea of post-normal times and the idea of moving from a dialogue to like a polylogue. So, you know, how do we get better at kind of allowing those spaces to emerge? And I think like you're saying, Galdino, like there has to be a space for science because I, I mean, I'm living currently in a place where like now everyone's wearing a mask and that's because everybody's been sick. Um, but like, you know, during the summer I was going crazy because nobody had a mask on and like, I don't even know how to begin to engage with, right, that kind of a space. And so like, I think it is about finding a way for, you know, that kind of conversation. And we're seeing this already, right? Cause it's not just like, it's science, it's medicine, it's public health, but also like the idea of a consensus reality um, and, and how, you know, that has very real, you know, practical impacts on on how we live and and our you know health i think andre is trying to but like I, yeah, I it shows hear. up as talking, but I can't hear. Yeah. I think it might be a problem with the, the mic there. Yeah, there we, we can hear, like we can see, it seems like uh, uh, you should be the, there you go. Yeah, we can see you. I don't think we can hear you, but if you want to try try again, tell us about your Instagram experience or reality in general, see if it works. Yeah, I can't hear. I think the takeaway is we should make our own religion. I mean, just for the tax benefits alone, we should consider that. So, you joke, but <laughs> it's not a bad idea. 
Yeah, in Germany, in Germany is a thing. So you state your religion and automatically like you pay taxes and it goes uh, to to your uh, church. So that's one of the reasons why you have like a high amount of, of people with no re register with no religion. Yeah, Andre, it seems like the, the connection isn't isn't working out as you said in the chat. Um, so like, a, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, we just I would just say like a. Uh, Stephen is is asking uh, to explain the concept uh, affordable in the context of science. Affordable, like in the in the sense of design, like uh, in design affordances. Or in what sense? You can you can ask yourself. There you go. Ah, you wanted me to. Ah, no, no, that's a question actually I ask because yeah, uh, yeah. Olivia asked for uh, that. Um, the problem might be that science isn't um, affordable to everyone. And I was curious about what is affordable for science, for instance. Is it about uh, buying medicine or is it about uh, understanding the knowledge uh, shared? So I was just curious actually. So maybe Olivier can tell us. Understandable, understandable, accessible, understandable. Oh, OK, OK, OK. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a big challenge, right? Because, you know, if you ask people to explain TCP IP or the basics of HTML, they're like, uh, no. But like, if you ask someone how to like set up an Instagram or Facebook account, right, we can do that. So like, the question is like, what is the like, what is the level of knowledge that you, we think people need to be, you know, um, confident or competent to be able to speak on a variety of issues. And so like, um, like for my doctoral research, I looked at geoengineering. So like, you know, mass engagement in the global climate system to deal with, you know, of course, like climate change. Um, and what's fascinating and we think about reality is there are groups who have denied climate change for a long time, like the Heartland Institute, but now are embracing geoengineering, the idea of actually manipulating the global climate system. So like, mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's a huge question, right? Like, you know, because it affects everybody. So if we can adjust the global, let's say, thermostat, who participates in that conversation? Um, you know, who should have a voice? And of course, it should be as diverse and inclusive as possible. Um, but, you know, Andy mentioned this idea, like the Church of the Earth. I think that's what we're seeing with like Greta's movement and Extinction Rebellion. Like there seems to be this shift of like trying to find ways of of re-engaging this this question about you know we know we're on we know we're on a spaceship and we know that the planet has certain boundaries and um the one thing that hasn't seemed to have a boundary is like our capacity to mess with that system um but also imagination so can we put that to work and futures literacy seems like a good conduit for that um i guess the question is the tempo right like do we get our act together and get help from the Galactic Federation before we before we blow it up, or uh, or does the clock run out? Yeah. Well, with that in mind, I think we should uh, we should be wrapping up. Um, I think this has been a fascinating conversation. I mean, we did not really know what this would turn into, and thankfully, it was fruitful nonetheless. Um, we're going to be well. We're spending the day uh, at the summit, so there's a lot more coming up, and. Um, I don't know, John, do you have any parting words on the Galact for the Galactic Federation, for those listening in? Yeah, I mean, look, I all I want to know is, like, are do they have uniforms or is it more of just a show up with what you're wearing situation? I mean, that to me is really interesting because I, I'm not necessarily interested in the conversation around, like, like the standardization, right? Like, do they have an, a space air traffic control system? And like, how, who operates that, right? Like that to me is what's fascinating is the minutia of it. Like, how do you actually run the galactic federation of species? And, and you know, like, yeah, I don't know. That to me is fascinating. Like, do they use the metric system or is there like some outlier planet that's like, no, 
we have our own measures and we don't care. And like, yeah, how do you, how do you manage that? I don't know. That's interesting to me. It's all plank lengths. Uh, so with that, um, thank you so much for showing up and um, we'll see more of you in the, um, in the next two days. Thanks so much, guys. Ciao. Ciao, ciao, ciao.